welcome to the channel. In this video, I will share my top 10 watercolor tips and summarize my favorite techniques that I've shared over the past year to help you get inspired and grow your watercolor practice into the new year. And since this is a holiday end of year video, I will demonstrate every tip using this festive watercolor, a partridge in a pear tree, a perfect holiday composition. And as always, if you want to paint along with me in real time, the full partridge tutorial is available on my Patreon along with a black and white outline, step-by-step -step photos, and a list of materials including alternative pigment choices. So if you're ready, let's get right into it. Tip number one is plan your layers. So watercolors like other transparent mediums are made for layering, meaning building your color and darker values step by step. Don't try to get all your details in one go. This is what often leads to muddy colors and lots of frustration for watercolor beginners. You want to start with a very light underpainting, which you see me do here wet on wet with large blocks of color blending into each other, creating the overall shape of the bird. Once this layer is dry and you have what I would call a map of colors, you can move on to your top layers and work out the fine details like the dark feathers in this case and accentuate areas of light and shadow by adding more saturated color. Once you plan your layers, you are likely wondering what colors to use and and in my second tip, I recommend slowly extending your palette to include warmer and cooler variations of your main pigments. This will help you in two ways. Number one, you will have more flexibility in building three-dimensional form on paper. And number two, you will start over time incorporating your favorite pigment combinations and building your unique sense of style. So for my partridge bird, I identified three base colors, a cool dark indigo blue, a reddish perylene violet, and burnt sienna. I then extended my primary palette to include vibrant thylo blue and some variations of my burnt sienna to bring some warm light to the feathers. Even on the beak, I used two different reds to allow some variations in light and shadow. And I know the traditional advice for beginners is to only use the primary colors and try to mix everything else using only this limited palette of yellow, red, and blue, which is a fine piece of advice and a good technique to master. But over time, you will want to create your own signature palette, and I encourage you to experiment. For more examples and a detailed explanation of my palette extension technique, you can watch this video that I saved below in the description. Tip number three, and this is probably the one you've been waiting for if you enjoy painting animals and birds or even portraits, and I promise it's super easy and very effective. In order to make your subject look more realistic, you want to include a small highlight on the eye. This tiny detail will make all the difference, creating a more realistic sense of three-dimensional shape that reflects light. You can paint around your highlight using a smaller brush like I did on this bird, use masking fluid like I'm doing here, or use white gouache or white gel pen all the way in the end to mark one or two small white spots. Whatever method you choose, I promise it will do wonders to your work and make your subject look really alive. Tip number four is to avoid black. So your first instinct may be to apply black to the darkest area of your painting, like the feather details I'm painting here, but this is actually a sure way to make your watercolor look really muddy. The thing about black pigments in general is that they're not made to mix with other colors, so you won't be able to achieve smooth color transitions and blend them seamlessly. Instead, you have a variety of pigment options that you can choose from for a much more realistic effect. And I'm talking about other pure pigments like indigo blue that I'm using here, or you can mix your own black using different proportions of red, blue, and yellow. For example, a very common combination could be permanent alizarin crimson, quinacridone gold, and ultramarine blue. Now that we talked about black, let's quickly touch on painting white. As you paint different things, you will encounter white elements like the neck of this partridge bird. And the one thing that will really help you achieve a more realistic look is adding a bit of color to your shadows. As you can see here, I've applied a lighter version of my base sienna and indigo under the bird's neck. Because in real life, all shadows have reflections of color from the surrounding objects. The easiest thing is to use cooler pigments 
difference from the blue side of the spectrum on your shadows. But do consider what's around. In this case, brown feathers on top of the bird are likely to also give out a bit of a warm reflection, which is why I'm using Sienna. So my tip is to stay away from gray pigments when you're building shadows and adding definition to white elements in your watercolor painting. And if you want to learn more about painting and entirely white subjects like this rose, I have saved the tutorial in the video description below. Tip number six is to use granulating pigments to create texture. This is particularly useful for beginner artists who want to create rich textures without getting lost in several layers of watercolor because granulating pigments give us the ability to create gorgeous effects simply by interacting with water. Here I'm using my Green Appetite Genuine and Cascade Green from Daniel Smith. I cover the leaf outline, wait about 30 seconds for the water to sink in, and then drop clear water right on top. You can see how the particles spread and travel on the surface of my paper and you can observe what the final result looks like here when it's dry. I absolutely adore using this method for greenery specifically, but you can also apply it for landscapes and many other subjects. And if you want to learn more about painting green leaves, I have a detailed tutorial on my channel that touches on everything from realistic layering with transparent pigments to one-step beginner-friendly method with granulating colors. Tip number seven is all about glazing, meaning layering transparent colors to change the look of the underlying layers. Most of the time you can easily adjust the color temperature and make something look much warmer, like it's facing the sun, simply by adding a glaze of transparent yellow or warm thylo yellow green like I'm using here. Alternatively, you can make something look much cooler and further away by glazing transparent blues or aqua green from Windsor & Newton like I'm doing here. It's a bluish transparent green. Glazing is one of the essential watercolor techniques that will give you the power to transform the look of your watercolor painting entirely and build dimension. Just remember to glaze transparent pigments over granulating and not the other way around. Tip number eight is about watercolor backgrounds. We all struggle sometimes with choosing the right color for the background and maybe even leaving it white because we don't want to overpower the main subject, but I highly recommend this in-between solution, which I often add to my paintings when I can decide on the right pigment for the solid background. I showed this to you in the deer tutorial and you may have seen this in my peony and parrot videos. Essentially, it involves adding a bunch of background objects that fill up the background space to a degree, but using very light variations of blue and not a lot of detail. Blue colors appear to be further in the distance to human eye, and as you can see here, I've added a bunch of simplified leaf shapes in the back, creating an additional sense of depth without overpowering my bird with a solid background color. And once you have your main subject ready and your background figured out, tip number nine is to soften some edges, meaning remove the sharp contrast between different color areas by glazing a layer of shadow color over the edges. This is one of the more tricky techniques that can really distinguish a beginner level watercolor from a more realistic dimensional work as it helps accentuate the right areas of contrast in your painting. Tip number 10, don't call it a mistake. So this is super important as I often read comments from other artists saying, oh, this painting of mine turned out terrible or this one was full of mistakes. And it absolutely breaks my heart because this is just not helpful. I truly believe we get more experience and we get better with every stroke. Even your unsuccessful paintings will take you a step closer to deeper understanding of the watercolor medium. Knowing what doesn't work is just as important as knowing what works because every time you sit down to paint you will be making choices about your colors and your technique so you need to know what to avoid just as much as you need to practice the right techniques i had to repaint these chinese lanterns because my background just didn't work and i have so many other examples like these where my first attempt was not very successful. But when it happens, be kind to yourself. It's just a learning experiment. Call it a study, not a mistake. 
Now, you may wonder why I didn't mention negative painting in this top 10 list. Negative painting is definitely my favorite watercolor technique, but I feel like it deserves its own special video. And I already have a general overview on my channel, which I will leave a link to in the video description below. But based on your requests, I will be doing a whole new tutorial on negative painting when we start the new year. So stay tuned, like and share if you enjoyed these tips. And I wish everyone who celebrates a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year full of inspiration. Happy Holidays and I'll see you soon.